Okay. Perfect. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this workshop today on science policy, advocacy, and science communication. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to give a quick um, update on our organization for human brain mapping. Just go ahead and present some slides. So this workshop is organized by the Organization for Human Brain Mapping Student and Postdoc uh, Special Interest Group. And we're a group of trainees from across the world. Uh, we have current members up here and our new incoming members uh, shown uh, down below. And we're involved in organizing um, events surrounding the Organization for Human Brain Mapping annual meeting uh, to support uh, trainee engagement and um, career development. So we've already had a couple of successful workshops leading up to the Organization for Human Brain Mapping, which will be happening in Glasgow in a couple of weeks. Um, so here are the three that we've organized. Uh, we've already had one successful career development workshop in Mandarin, uh, which is very exciting. Last week, we hosted a workshop on transitioning from um, academia to industry. Uh, and today, um, we have three wonderful speaker speakers who will be telling us about their experience transitioning from academia into science policy and advocacy work with a focus on um, the importance of science communication. At the conference, we'll also be hosting um, some other events. We'll be focusing on um, re-envisioning the future of academic training. Uh, so don't forget to attend that one. And if you'll be with us at the conference as well, we'll have a workshop on becoming uh, a leader in human neuroscience with um, past and current chairs of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. So with that, I will um, stop my share and welcome our three speakers today. So I won't waste too much time on introductions and give our speakers time to introduce themselves, but um, we have Joseph Keller, Fanuel Muindi, and Vanya Kao, who will be sharing with us their uh, journeys from academia to um, science policy, science advocacy, and more science communication type of roles. So the format, um, I think, will be such that we have 10 minutes for each speaker to share their journey with us. And then we can have a few minutes after each speaker's uh, presentation to take questions, but maybe save a larger chunk at the end to have a, a more engaging discussion, if that sounds good for everyone. Perfect. Uh, so I guess we can get started. Perhaps, uh, Joseph, would you like to kick us off? It sounds great. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, bear with me as I try to put together these these technical aspects. Um, I will have to say, uh, years ago, 2016, I was in Geneva for OHPM. So this brings back some very fond memories. Can everyone see the screen? Perfect, yeah. Great, so uh, this is the moment where I give the classic disclaimer that the things I'm gonna talk about today don't have anything to do with the folks that I've worked for, for before, but have everything to do with my thoughts and opinions um, of, of me. So uh, I, my, my conversation today is gonna focus a little bit on the US research enterprise uh, but happy to have a conversation at the end about the, the global international aspects of that. So I'll try to keep this brief. I started my academic career focusing on biology and neuroscience and psychology. I did research at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where I got my undergrad degree. I did computational research for a master's degree. And 
my doctorate was focused on human brain mapping, obviously, but cognitive neuroscience focusing on the aging process uh, and how individual differences between groups and within groups change around the aspects of working memory, attention, and mind wandering. And after that experience, and you know, working with research for almost a decade, I then made the very logical choice to become an executive search consultant. So you may ask, what is that? Basically, I have two main roles. One is that I'm a, I'm a recruiter, basically to a candidate community of folks looking for jobs, but I'm also a consultant to institutions looking to hire someone. They typically have search committees that come together for that. I work specifically in the states within the STEM and higher ed field. So this could be looking for folks to become presidents of universities, provosts, deans, chairs of departments. Um, but also biomedical research institutions and otherwise, but other civic sector nonprofit organizations like uh, symphony orchestras and zoos and conservation societies and community colleges, trying to focus on institutions that are important to civic society that don't really have financial stakeholders. It's really the people that drive their success. While there, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of amazing people and learn about people's trajectories, understanding where they've been, where they're trying to go. Many of them had experience working in policy and government in some way, shape, or form. Some of it has to do with the local level, state level, and federal level. And so I then took a cue from them wanting to try to add that to my career. I moved back down from Boston, where I was living at the time, to work in Washington, D.C. Took part of the, it's called the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. I was at the National Science Foundation. This is a unique institution that focuses on funding basic research in the states. And I was placed at the Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate, basically the Computer Science Directorate of NSF, which funds over 80% of basic CS research in the states. So I did this for a few reasons. One, I wanted to be uncomfortable. I wanted to be surrounded by new and different people. I was the only neuroscientist there, surrounded by computer scientists. It was an interesting experience. But secondly, secondly, I was very curious about artificial intelligence. And so in my first year, I worked on a lot of interdisciplinary neuroscience-based programming, computational neuroscience. Some of you rec may recognize the acronym CRCNS was one of the programs I worked on. But in my second year, I helped launch, which I'll describe later, which is the National AI Research Institute's program, and that was a very uh, interesting experience. But my most recent uh, position was for an association in the States called the American Psychological Association. This is a group representing about 133,000 science-based or psychology-based practitioners, educators, and psychological scientists in, in the States. And I'm helping to represent their interests to the federal government represent their interests to Congress. And so I'll share a little bit about how that works. When I was at NSF, I mentioned this AI Research Institute's program. Um, this was interesting because uh, NSF is a relatively small institution compared to others. And so we led it in terms of ideology, but not in terms of money. And so you'll learn how big money is as the, as the conversation goes forward. And what we try to do is put together a lot of disparate theme-based interdisciplinary research institutes that involve multiple schools and universities and colleges working together, funded behind a theme. So for example, the United States Department of Agriculture helped fund one theme-based AI research institute that had to do with AI and agriculture and, and so on. And so I helped uh, start this program in its first year. I think now it's in its third year and it's grown its partnerships outside of other government agencies to involve um, industry folks like Google and Intel and Accenture. But, but I'll focus today on uh, what I've most recently been doing, which is this advocacy part. Uh, Alisa talked about science communication. It takes a lot of different forms. For me in my role, the communicating science, a lot has to do with narrative. And so I'll share some examples of that. But primarily, my job is to try to get resources for the executive branch agencies that we care about. For me and my science advocacy colleagues who care about agencies like the National Institutes of Health, NSF, where I work, the Department of Defense and Department of Transportation, just as example, I had a portfolio of executive branch agencies that I was responsible for, but also issues that cross all of those agencies, issues like climate change, issues like artificial intelligence, issues like thinking about the future of work. 
And so when we tried to do our job uh, for our community, we were trying to get congressional appropriations, basically asking Congress to make sure that those agencies are funded um, at appropriate levels. We're always asking them to fund them with higher levels of funding each year. And that process is called appropriations. Um, interesting to know that these agencies cannot raise their hand and ask for more money themselves. And so they rely on folks like myself and other like-minded stakeholders to try to make sure that they have access to the resources they need to fund the science that we care about. And a lot of it has to do with storytelling. So often we highlight different aspects of science and society. So whether it's trying to describe to them the way that psychological, social, um, and behavioral science are related to the distribution of the vaccine, for example, or related to understanding the behavioral changes of climate change. And in, in this example right here, we partnered with another organization called the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society to respond to a plan that the government had for autonomous vehicles. We wanted to, to let them know that this sounds pretty neat, but we also think that you should focus a lot on the human element of what you're doing. Make sure that you understand that there are safety rules and regulations that need to be implemented. We ask you to slow down and include humans in a lot more of your uh, expertise and trials. So that's just one example of how we highlighted the value of, of science to Congress. But what I think is the most interesting part of my role is trying to train and educate. So many people are looking for opportunities to get involved, to understand why the work they're doing in the lab matters to their government for where they live. Uh, often we host what are called, or used to be called, Hill Days before the pandemic, where you would come to Washington, D.C. and learn about a few different bills we would tell you uh, that were related to the science that you do in the places where you work. Uh, you would then take that information and go to Congress the next day, speak with a staffer or speak with the representative themselves, whether from the House or from the Senate. Tell them about uh, who you are, where you come from, and, and why the work you do is important, and then integrate in the bills that we, we told you about to help show them that there's an importance to who, they, who you are and what you're doing. So they actually see the face for the story that you're trying to tell. We find that to be a really compelling way uh, to get things done. Hopefully get them to endorse a bill that we're suggesting. One brief example of a day in the life of this work during the pandemic, which was strange. Many of you may be aware of the TSA PreCheck program in, in the States, and this is trying to get you faster through the airports. Uh, if you look at the boxes for eligibility criteria, you may see a few statements related to mental health and mental wellness, and mental illness. Um, going through myself, I found some of these statements to be awkward. Um, they didn't exactly characterize mental illness correctly, and we thought that they stigmatized it. So we reached out to them, and to their credit, they were open, and they, we wanted to say, hey, we have experts here that are that know a lot about mental health, know a lot about mental wellness and about the legal system. We wanna help you ensure that the flying public is safe, but making sure that mental health and wellness is not stigmatized. So they oblige, we work with them to help reword their language for eligibility criteria um, by working with psychological scientists. So that's just one example of the type of work we were doing to advocate on behalf uh, of our organization. I'll end by saying uh, there's always a place for scientists engineers, educators, working in government, working in policy. Uh, the background and training we have, I think is relevant, not only to specific areas we work in as experts, but also to the process by which we understand and think through policy. We ask good questions. We know how to think critically, and we know how to communicate to different people based on the groups we're talking to in any one day, like talking to human brain mapping neuroscientists. So um, happy and looking forward to talking about these type of careers and, and thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Joe. That was a great overview. And um, I found it really interesting that you brought up the fact that it's also important for uh, people in government or making policy to like communicate to us scientists how our work is informing them. So that kind of crosstalk is not just one way, it's two way. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can drop one in the chat. Um, but maybe I can kick us off with one. Um, so I guess if you look back in your training, like what would you say are some of the more important skills that you were able to bring into your, your work in science policy and um, 
what skills did you maybe have to learn on the job that you uh, didn't expect to need? Uh, that's a great question. I, I'm looking forward to my, my fellow panelists answers, but, but I think you often may know the speed of the type of work you do may change if you leave academia. I think we often work on hard, hard, complex problems that take many years to try to make one step forward in the progress. Uh, in other fields, you're really working on much more limited information and decisions have to be made much quicker. So I think one of the biggest things I learned was to try to be faster and quicker in my decision making with, with less information. Sometimes you're wrong, but the, the pace you'll understand is a lot faster on the outside. With, with that said, though, I think that asking good questions and slowing the process down is often helpful. And I think one of the benefits to bringing our background to other fields like this is that we slow down and ask good questions in, in ways that people might not have thought about, given the type of experimental design we've, we've put together in our research, given um, journal clubs and lab meetings we've had to, to participate in, where people poke holes in our research. And so, you know, I think a lot of those experiences can be helpful in transfer. That's great to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, let people warm up a little bit. Um, but I guess I, I'm kind of curious if you could speak to um, like how does government like prioritize what they're gonna focus on in terms of like science research um, and yeah, I guess like what what the process is from going from research to policy. I know that's kind of probably a huge process, but uh, if you could just touch upon it a, a little bit more generally, that would be great. Classic answer, which is that it depends. Mm -hmm. I, I think what what is nice is the one of the reasons I chose to work in a science funding agency was I, I got to see how you make those decisions the very smart people that are working in government to think about what sort of science issues are next to put out the call for funding that we all look and respond to to try to make the deadline for. I think that process is interesting in understanding how input is taken from the community to understand what to look forward to next. Really, it's driven often, not only by the folks who work in the agencies, but often by what the community says is the next big thing. What are the next big things to fo focus on? Um, that doesn't always happen, but it's a nice process. I think when I also took an opportunity to move into more engagement with Congress, the folks that give the money away, this was me trying to understand, well, after the agencies decide what science is important, how do you then bridge the gap between how you get the resources to do the science? That, for me, was one of those processes that wasn't as clear. This is when there becomes less about science and more about policy or often politics, at least in the states. And so I made some of these decisions deliberately to make sure I had a chance to see both aspects of that process if I were able to break it down into simplistic form into two, um, because I felt it was crucial to try to understand and see both of those. Thank you for that answer. Um, definitely a multifaceted. Uh process. Um, we have a question from the audience from Jenna Blujou. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, she asks, uh, thank you for this great talk. I'm curious how you found your first position as an executive search consultant. Said another way, how did you go about the job search process? Did you use certain job search engines or um, did you find work through connections and networking? I regret to say I'm a Luddite. I, I'm not smart enough to use any of those fancy uh, search engines or processes to, to find jobs. They really haven't worked out for me. I know much smarter people who, who do that and they're very successful. For me, it was about people. Um, at the time I was spending a, a lot of time at what we had was the career services department of my institution. This was a place where I got to hear about what employers were looking for and the jobs they were trying to hire, and then see lists of people that would hire people like myself. Ultimately, it's how I got that first job um, at a place that had never hired anyone like me. 
uh, at my level. And so it was risk taking on both sides, me going into a field um, that didn't on the surface seem to be a right fit for me and the other employer wanting to hire someone um, that doesn't fit the profile, the people they typically hire that have success in those roles. Um, so I would just say people matter a lot. Uh, so try to tap into to folks you know that are in positions that you think are nice and have conversations with them to understand how they got there and perhaps they can help you as well. Thanks for that. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll um, move on to uh, Fanuel, our next speaker. Um, we'll give you the floor, <laughs> the virtual floor. Uh, sure. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, and thank you all to, to my panelists as well, fellow panelists that are sharing their story. So I'll be brief. I'm going to try and be brief so that we can just get into Q&A and so forth. So if I leave you today with a question, uh, and I'm going to, I'll say a lot of this, like, get everything I say today, X or Y. So yeah, heads up about that. Um, so the question is really, what story in science are you building? Um, very much my story is still being written, as most of yours are but I encourage you to think of it as a story that you're writing. Um, so my name is Samuel, uh, and today I'll be talking to you from the perspective of being a founder and chief resident at SAI, the STEM Advocacy Institute um, that I founded. Um, so uh, uh, right to it, um, one of the things that I want you to remember is, is a quote from Denzel, which I really love, the only thing stopping you from achieving your dreams are the stories you keep telling yourself that you can't. So don't wait, act right now. Um, and I really encourage you to really take that step forward and being here is another one of those steps. Um, and one of those things that are kind of stopping us a lot of time is our own negative committees in our heads. And we all have them, different, different levels. Some people call it imposter feelings, not syndrome, feelings that are there and those are normal. Um, so, so here's an article that I wrote away back when of my own imposter um, feelings, uh, check it out if you if you will. But the long story short there is that tell it to shut up this negative committee that's in your head, okay? So before we get into the whole spiel, uh, I'm originally from Tanzania, um, did, uh, born there, that's home, went to high school in the UK, then came to Atlanta, uh, then packed my bags up again, went to California, got tired of California, came over to the East Coast, where I've been here in the Boston area for the past, I can't believe I want to say it, almost 10 years. So this is one way to look at my story. Um, another way is this way, which I don't like so much, but I just want to show you that I try to just change perspectives. You know, From Morehouse, as I told you, uh, in Atlanta, then I went to grad school at Stanford, where I fell in love um, uh, with circadian biology. And I'll show you a few of those questions that I was asking there, then packed my bags, came to MIT, had a two body problem there. So if you can ask me questions about that. And then I uh, left the bench uh, and I was just at Harvard for about six years, six and a half years running the department, um, the, the program there in molecular and cellular biology. A lot of fun, different set of questions completely, starting up my own organization with SAI. And now I am at Hopkins which I won't talk too much about because it's just really, really brand new and I'm still trying to figure it out, if you will. So that's one way to look at it, linear fashion. But of course, as you know, life is rarely like that, right? It's more like this, right? That you start off at sorry, college, figure it, thought about I was going to be studying X, but actually it did Y, then did a whole bunch of turns, the twists and turns, grad school, things working out, things not working out. And of course, as I told you in my postdoc, I switched, um, I left the postdoc to really pursue things outside of the bench, never left science, never left science, just left the bench to ask a new set of questions. And this sort of going back and forth is still happening. I can now be honest to tell you, this is, hasn't ended. The most recent one was, again, making this transition from having left the bench and being at Harvard, uh, running the PhD program there, thinking ahead and asking myself, what's next? What do I want to do now? What kinds of questions do I want to be asking? And I love what Joe was talking about earlier there, that we, we get trained on how to do this. And it's really, really important that you harness that skill set because it, it will take you really, really far. The questions you ask are super, super important, okay? 
So another way to look at this is really the question. This is what I, I look at my journey. It's just really an evolution of questions, you know, from um, Morehouse and Stanford, what I was really fascinated by was looking at state changes. How does the brain control an animal moving from a behavioral state Y, from wakefulness, for example, to, to sleep or whatever state. And so the mechanism, the neural mechanisms there are fascinating, were fascinating to me, still are actually. <laughs> and went to uh, MIT to continue that, to really dig deeper, asking those fundamental questions. And at that time, things for me, the questions started to change. You know, they were not so much about uh, science and the you know how brain why act, is activated to control brain you know behavior z it became more about the role of science in society what is the role of science in society what are those mechanisms that are in place where are the barriers how can we reduce them wherever they may be globally remember i told you i'm from tanzania and it, and I very much was thinking from sort of my, that those early upbringing, thinking deeply about how can I play a role and help out there. So as you can see here, these are the publications that I was doing. So I was writing on all this time. And you may notice here, there's a familiar author in one of these papers, Joe, one of our panelists. So he and I crossed paths at MIT when he was a post, uh, when he was a graduate student, I was a postdoc actually at that time. And we started, again, this is the idea we started putting together. And so so a little tip here, don't be afraid to write down your ideas, uh, write them out. And I was even, we were not afraid. We wrote them out and actually told the world about our ideas. Okay. And for me, this is actually how uh, I got this gig at Harvard because they were really interested in the questions I was asking, the, the ideas that we were writing down together. Okay. And it didn't stop there, right? So it kept on developing. And the, this is how SAI came to be, thinking about the role of science in society. And the fundamental issue there for me was, how can I bring more people together to ask these questions? Okay, and we kept publishing, we kept writing down ideas. And, and for me, again, the aspect of writing is just really, really important, putting ideas out into the um, uh, into a sphere, um, if you will. And so this is where my sort of the questions have formulated into this sphere. I call it the informal science world, which brings together all the disparate elements, right, from policy, thinking about engagement, outreach, and asking these fundamental questions about how does this ecosystem operate to drive change out there, wherever that may be, with emphasis on increasing access between science, between people and science, okay? And when you, whether you think about that from organizationally, uh, funding, people, right, training, I look at this very, very expansively, and what I find fascinating are these connections in between how they move over time, how they change with different um, entities. And so, my lab at SAI, essentially, I'm very, very, very just interested in thinking about the developmental side of things. How do these connections develop? Uh, where do they break down? Um, how do these organizations and ideas come about? How do they die, for example? I find that very fascinating. And I encourage you to just uh, Google, um, visit my lab and just check out the publications that we're writing, books that we put together, tools that we've designed. It's been a lot of fun. And might, might I add, all of this SAI is all on the side, okay? Evening and weekends, all right? And this is what I was at postdoc, and even though I was at a Harvard, I do that for like fun, like my pastime. Um, and we can discuss further about how, how that, how do you manage that? It can be really, really tough. So there's a tool that really, really helped me and, and it's called the logic model. If you've never heard of this, uh, here's a QR code at the bottom you can take. Essentially what it means is that really putting together the different aspects, right? Of uh, the problem, solution, activities, outputs and outcomes intended, right? For a program to have impact out there, whether individually or at the program level. And that kind of thinking, which is really what drives SAI, is really just, again, connecting the causes and effects to, to drive measurable outcomes of interest. And you can do this like as part of your individual development plan, right? Asking yourself, what is the core question that is driving all my decisions that I'm making to do X or Y, okay? And so that's how SAI was built. This is my personal uh, logic model, if you call it, the professional logic model. And again, driving, being driven by this core issue for me is thinking more broadly about how as a self-described social, social entrepreneur, 
how do I build top tier, fundable, sustainable, impactful initiatives and organizations that build connections between science and society? How do I do that? Because I we know it's really, really, really hard, right? And so how do we do that? And so for me, building this has allowed me to think strategically and, and tactfully every time I'm either pursuing a job or funding, connecting with people, I go back here and say, how does it fit in this framework, right? Giving this talk today, how does it fit in this framework, right? Which activity, what kind of activity, right? Informal interviews, courses, workshops, conferences I attend. You try, I try at least, I try, it doesn't work every time to connect the dots and see the bigger picture and see which aspect of this uh, logic model it's pulling and pushing, all right? And an SAI, and I won't go into detail with it, essentially SAI is built like that. Uh, we are very much basically a launch pad to help founders at the earliest stages where they're building these initiatives to launch, okay? And what we do is provide community funding professional resources, mentorship, and who are they? Most of them are graduate students, postdocs, and even some um, uh, social entrepreneurs who are now finding us, okay? And again, this is a side thing so far. I haven't been telling you what I'm doing on the <laughs> full, full time. Well, what we've been able to do, and it's been absolutely amazing to bring in these ideas and launch them from scratch, uh, whether they are science communication driven ideas, uh, we've had people who have created uh, podcasts, you name it. It's just really amazing to have seen people come in with all these uh, diverse ideas. And, and uh, so the fellows in particular, the fellows program in the middle here is where we get a lot of uh, uh, graduate students who come through and we help them launch and we give them a little bit of seed funding, a little bit of seed funding to, to do that. And so if you're really curious about us, take a look at this paper we just published, actually. Um, you can learn more about uh, the SAI and what we're doing um, and how it was set up and so forth. I, I unfortunately don't have time to tell you all the intricate details, but I encourage you to please reach out because I would love to tell you more about it and, and everything that's happening uh, because the funding we've, we've received um, to do this work has been phenomenal. And, and, and I think it's just part of part of what I think I also want to leave you with is take a chance right um, I always encourage individuals if you have an idea for something you want to create go for it just just try it out um, I got that role at Harvard they love what I was doing on the side okay and I think even with Hopkins I, they love the questions that I'm asking and the and I think that is you're looking at employers and so forth, that is something that I try to look for that, hey, I'm bringing my whole self into this, right? Um, and I hope you will accept me for who I am. So build your logic model, okay? And keep iterating, keep iterating, do not stop because that's where for me, I go back to every time when I'm like stuck and I don't know what, what I'm doing and the purpose, right? If you're trying to find it, logic model really, really, really helps. Uh, it isn't easy, lots of hurdles, lots and lots and lots of hurdles that I've barely scraped the surface here. Um, balancing act between the, you know, doing this thing on the side and actually running, doing your actual job, it can be tricky. Absolutely, very, very tricky. And I'm happy to entertain those questions as they come. But take it one step at a time. Um, I am nowhere near like, you notice here there's a bunch of arrows going all in you know, three different directions here. I don't know where it's leading me. All I know is like I just want to keep asking interesting questions at the interface of science and society and make a difference out there in the world. Okay, so get in touch. Um, uh, I kind of give you a little bit of some of the things I think about, uh, but my website, my lab website, the fellows program, which we're accepting uh, fellows at the moment um, for this coming fall. And yeah, connect with me, Twitter, and the rest of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manuel. That was wonderful. Such a great overview. <laughs> so many different um, wonderful initiatives. I think we can all relate to your diagram with all the dots and you know, a lot yeah. of things <laughs> taking you in different directions. Um, I also really liked your um, the diagram you had that kind of looks like a, a cell. Um, with all the different um, parts in it, but looking at science more broadly, I think it's really interesting to yeah. visualize the whole sphere and not just within like your lab and university setting. It's it's much greater than that. Um, yeah. I think uh, 
the fellowship opportunities that you mentioned would probably oh, yeah. be quite appealing to a number of individuals um, within the OHBM group and on this call. Um, I guess maybe I have a quick question to kick us off and then we'll see if uh, the audience has anything to ask, but you mentioned at the beginning to tell your negative committee to shut up. Um, and I was just wondering if you had some advice on ways in which you help yourself do that in order to get your ideas and these all these like quote unquote side projects out and actually using them to make impact in the world. Yeah, um, and and I have one of my other talks. Uh, the title is um, like do the side things. Actually, like <laughs> let that be the engine of everything else that you do. Um, so what I try usually to tell, ask myself is connect that to the central um, problem that I am like that is driving me, and it's hard to find it. Sometimes you don't know what it is. I'll be very frank. Sometimes or or you're like you thought it was X actually, but it's not, right? And so for me, having stumbled that. My now, as I mentioned, my self identity is in the, in the social entrepreneur, right? Even entrepreneur too, um, in that realm. And the problem that drives me is thinking like, how do we provide a space and community to be able to launch really fascinating and impactful ideas in this space around the world, right? Why? Because it's so freaking hard, right, to do this. And so I go back to that genesis, and it's what drives me. It's what shuts down the negative committee. Um, we don't have time to go over this, but with SAI, Joe knows the story because he's he's been there from the beginning. Um, you have some hard times too about how do I how am I going to make this sustainable? How am I going to fund this? Is this something I want to do full time eventually, right? Or is this something just on the side for now? All these are questions, but I go back to the fundamental thing and ask myself, hey, am I making progress forward? And the answer inevitably is always yes, right? Is it slow? Sure. SAI, we've been doing it for almost seven years, okay? And are we where, you know, where are we pretty far along? Yes, <laughs> but we still have a long way to go. So going back to the fundamental problem helps a lot. And for me, that's, that's been the people I connect with, um, the people I reach out to for help, Right when when I'm stuck and I'm saying, hey, I need I need help with this. It, I don't know what I'm going to do here for X. And so, um, going back to the problem has always been helpful. That's really helpful. Yeah, I think I guess if there's a a strong conviction and a supportive community, then you can put those negative thoughts aside and and move forward. Um, exactly. And. Oh, we have a, a question from Anne. So she's asking, how do you manage to combine your side projects with your job? And I know you touched upon this, that you, you, you might be open to talking about how you juggle it all, but yeah, where do you find the time? And is it something you need to discuss with your, your supervisor or your employer that you are doing these side things? And yeah, how have you na navigated that space? Yeah, it's not, it's not easy. When we started at uh, MIT was very much just kind of a very, we didn't know what the hell it was. So it was just on the side. <laughs> so I was just writing random stuff. Um, but you need to be just really good with your time. Like really, really, really good. For me, it's always, hey, I'm giving, I'm, when I'm at work, I'm at work. And when I'm doing this stuff, I'm, I'm over there. Right. And so it, it's, it's also when I started at Harvard, for example, um, they were, they actually, they were really excited about what I was doing on the side. <laughs> Even in my introduction email, it's like, hey, so he's doing this thing and, and it fits in with uh, what we're trying to do as a department. And so it was a win-win for everybody. Um, but ultimately the focus is the role that you're getting paid for, okay? And I think you just need to be clear that in your time space, you're allocating enough to make sure that nothing is dropped, right? You're giving it your 100, 110% even, right? So that um, everybody's happy. Over time, you, you become better. You become more efficient. So SA is no longer like at the beginning stages. Now, there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of different pieces. And so when I find time, like weekends and nights are actually great <laughs> because then I'm like done with the other one and I switch hats and, and I have full on like 
interests, right? And weekends are like my time. I can do whatever I want to do with them. But at the beginning, it's about taking time. You do it slowly, slowly, slowly. Like I'll do five minutes here, right? Quick email, or I'll be reading X. I'll be doing Y. And you do a little bit over time, it adds up. The books we've written, it took two years. And it was like evenings where we got together and we writ- wrote it. Even the paper with Joe, it was, we were just a couple, one or two hours here, you know, in the weekends. And then multiply that over a couple of months, suddenly you've done something, right? So my advice and to answer your question explicitly is just take it slow. There's no rush. Um, I, I, just, I just want to make sure that all these projects I'm doing, they align and, and move forward. Um, so, so yeah, but it helps if you definitely are communicating um, and making sure that it doesn't, again, your, your full-time world is not being affected. That's really good advice. And it's encouraging to hear that, um, you know, you can take little steps, baby steps, and eventually they build up to something amazing, hopefully, <laughs> as you've done. Um, so thank you again, Fenwell, for sharing um, yeah. your journey. I think in the interest of time, we're, we'll move on to Vanya. And then if there's some time at the end, we can have a more uh, general discussion with everyone. But um, some really great nuggets of advice for the group. Thank you. Awesome. Um, would you mind, like, I can't disconnect the, oh, <laughs> the screen uh, share. I don't know why, but I can... I don't know if I can. Let me see. Um, let me see where. I did. Oh, there we go. Thank okay. You. Perfect. No worries. Um, all right, Vanya, the floor is yours. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Vanya Cow. I'm a senior marketing manager at a genetic testing company today. And uh, Speaking of side gigs and side projects, helping fellow graduate students and postdocs and academics figure out what the next step is, especially if you're interested in moving beyond, is something that is my side gig and my passion um, that I've done it with Free the PhD. Um, and so I hope to bring some of these kind of career coaching insights to you in these 10 minutes as I kind of overview my journey outside of academia into various different roles in which science communication skills have been vital to success and hopefully give you guys some practical kind of actionable steps that you may be able to take if you're interested in pursuing something along these lines. So my background real quick um, is in systems neuroscience. I uh, went to Brown University and uh, it was a joint program with the National Institutes of Mental Health or NIH. There's a GPP program there, which is amazing. So I ended up doing my research um, at NIH and, you know, just using the kinds of skills that you don't really think employers are going to want. And I don't know if any of you in the audience feel the same, but I definitely was like, well, I just spent five years, you know, doing all this mouse work imaging. There's no one in the world who's going to hire me for this. And I was pretty sure that I didn't want to continue in the research space, Um, you know, I gave it a shot, right? You go to the PhD, there's really nothing else that you can do anymore to prove to yourself that, you know, bench research may not be for you. And, you know, that's kind of one of the first things that I want to point out here is that if you do or don't like something, really, you know, listen to yourself. Um, Don't feel like you need to force yourself in a particular direction just because everyone else thinks that you should or everyone else does. You know what? We're, we're, We're people who have reached the pinnacle of asking questions about the unknown, right? You're going to go places no one else has gone before. And that is something you should take ownership of. So, you know, kind of speaking to uh, what Fanwell had said, like, how do you make that negative committee shut up? Just do what they don't want you to do, right? And once you've done it and you've owned it, doesn't matter what they say anymore, right? Because you're going to be in a whole new world and other people care about different things once you leave the academic space, believe me. So, you know, I uh, ended up going to a startup company as my first transition out of academia. I was already pretty sure I didn't want to continue in research. Um, And, you know, speaking of all these side gigs, um, I absolutely agree. This is something that you have the power to do in your time when you have time in a direction that you're interested in. And this is really what's going to drive some of those things that both Joe and Fanwell talked about, those people, the networks that can help you get to new places. Some of you might be like, 
who, who I don't know anyone. Like, how am I supposed to find these people? If you go out and do something you enjoy, you're going to automatically meet people who care about the same things as you do. And lo and behold, they're going to know other people. And by, you know, your network grows from there. So, you know, you really just want to take it one step at a time. And for me, that first step out of academia came from it did come from my research world. So I happened to use a piece of equipment in my research that was made by the startup company. So, you know, I moved into a space that's different from both Fanwell and Joseph. So um, I'm in the commercial space or, you know, industry, I suppose, um, or in other words, the for-profit world, right? The dark side. So believe me, it's okay. You know, you'll, you'll survive if you decide to go to the dark side and, you know, <laughs> the for-profit world. Um, but, you know, that's what entrepreneurship is about as Ben Wells, you know, uh, has already mentioned. So it's, it's about profit, but the reason that you succeed in a for-profit world is because you, you really do something good and you really meet a need in the market, right? So there's a lot of good that researchers and scientists can do. Um, so the first job I got was an application scientist that basically, and again, I don't like to sugarcoat anything. So I like to kind of cut right to the core. It's basically a customer support representative, but for researchers in this case. So you can imagine the company I joined created this high-tech imaging equipment um, that I used in my research as a neuroscientist. So if they want to grow as a company, they need people who can speak the language of their customers who happen to be scientists. So being a PhD myself, I applied for a job that did not ask for a PhD. This is going to happen to a lot of you. You got to own it and you got to sell it, right? You got to tell them, why would you bother hiring me when you can hire someone potentially for less salary? Well, here are all the benefits that I can give you as a company, right, to your customers. I can talk to your PIs. I can talk to your grad students. I can do training. I understand how you publish. I know what kinds of papers you want to do with our equipment, right? So I can make training protocols to help your customers be successful, et cetera, et cetera. And that's exactly what I did. So, you know, it, science communication as a career path can feel very vague. It did to me. I was like, okay, well, I like communication and I like science, but you know, how does that equate to a job? So what you really want to think about is, you know, from your perspective of your domain expertise and the things you're passionate about, you know, who would value that? You need to be able to ask that question and you need to be able to answer it, right? So whether that's government, whether that's a nonprofit, whether it's, you know, academic administration or whether it's a for-profit, someone needs to value what you have to offer enough to pay you, right? Because that's what we all want when we want a job. So, you know, these science communication kind of centered jobs exist anywhere, um, you know, primarily in these places where they serve a scientific or technical audience. And so you can think about, you know, what do I like communicating about or what can I learn to communicate about, right? How can I practice that and prove to other people that I can do it in a manner that's a little different from, you know, writing manuscripts all day long. So, you know, just to kind of show how I got that first job, I did a lot of volunteer writing when I was a graduate student. I wrote for the Association for Women in Science. Those were all volunteer free, you know, freelance gigs. I wrote articles about electric cars and tenure and like, you know, random topics that I thought interest were interesting, but those became part of my writing portfolio. And when I applied to that startup job, that application scientist job, I included it. And I said, look, here are some examples of my writing where I'm speaking in more layman terms, right? As opposed to writing technical things in a manuscript only for my segment of the scientific community. So, you know, these are reasons why you want to do some of these side gigs um, because they, they are solid proof that you can do something. You can, sh you can, you know, take it out and show someone. Um, so from there, I would say my career kind of went in multiple, multiple directions. Um, I think everyone's does. You can know as you know, make a straight line if you want to. But for me, um, it was a startup company. I actually encourage all of you, if you're interested in moving into a different space outside of academia and you're interested in the for-profit world, um, look at startups. A lot of people just go straight for like the Pfizer's of the world. And, you know, there's a lot of competition there. So look at the up and coming places, right? Look at the cutting edge. Who's, you know, kind of commercialize something really new and interesting and impactful, right? And that's where, again, your value as a researcher becomes more highlighted, right? Because if you're going to a field that's kind of been there, done that, you know, they could hire many people with that skill set. But if you're going for something new, then that research ability becomes even more valuable to that organization, right? 
Um, yes, absolutely. Y Combinator, you can go to, um, you know, AngelList. Um, there's a lot of places that list startup organizations that, you know, you might be interested in. So I'm going to like real quick summarize the rest of my career in like two sentences. But essentially what I did was I moved into the commercial space um, of, a, of a company. So there's pretty much three, four departments in the commercial world, um, you know, customer service, sales, marketing, um, medical affairs, depending on, you know, if you go into a FDA regulated organization. And so I actually, I touched all of those. So again, I started in customer support um, as an application scientist. Um, then I started doing training, which is kind of linked. Some places have that as a separate department, but you know, you can imagine I can train one customer. I can train 10 customers. I can start to make workshops. I can start to make videos, et cetera. So I started building a training program. And then from there, I actually started doing marketing because as you, again, if you imagine if you go to a conference, right, who's making the brochures, who's deciding what we talk about to our audience, right? Um, you know, as, as researchers, we tend to just kind of grab lanyards and run away from the vendors. But if you're, if you can imagine yourself on the other side as a vendor, right, engaging researchers, that's a great place for people with our background. So I really enjoyed um, the marketing work that I did, which included things like going to trade shows, giving seminars, um, you know, figuring out what do we talk about? Um, are there webinars or talks that our customers want to hear about? And then from there, I ended up transitioning into sales. Um, because again, these things kind of make sense. If I have the marketing and technical background and I know how to present to people, in many ways I can do technical sales. So I traveled around Asia giving seminars and talks about our customers' papers. It's a form of selling, right? Um, so from there, I was actually recruited to a Mayo Clinic to help them sell their neurology test portfolio. That was during COVID, so that was an interesting experience where I traveled zero, even though I was supposed to travel half time. And then this new job that I have at Natera um, was also through a connection, this sort of network, this Rolodex that you start to build for your career. I uh, worked with this person that is now my boss um, very early on in my first job. So, you know, a lot of the serendipity that you hear about, other people say, it'll come to you as you take that first, second, third, next step outside of academia. Um, the important thing that you can do right now is, you know, I totally agree with everything that my fellow panelists have said. Um, as far as actionability, just, you know, talk to people. So if you're like just even a little bit interested in something, in an organization, in a startup, in a product, right? You don't even have to necessarily want a job there reach out to someone who works there, tell them that you're a trainee, that you wanna learn, that you're interested in making an impact one day, like they are, right? Have some you know, actionable questions, uh, like what you guys have been asking today. The more people you know, the more people can give you advice on which you can act. I would also say, if you are interested in science communication in any form, um, I'm in marketing today, so I do a lot of writing, I do a lot of editing, I do a lot of brainstorming on what kinds of content and resources that our audience wants to read about, to learn about our product. And then I also support our sales team as a marketer. So when they go out and speak with our customers, they need content, they need materials, they need, you know, presentations. That's our job too, right? Um, medical writers uh, also do similar kinds of content creation and resource development. Um, if those are things that interest you, you got to start writing now, right? Like you have to be able to practice those skill sets. Writing outside of the academic space takes practice. It's not the same voice. It's not the same tone, right? And you want to give yourself the opportunity to start producing some of this content. And whether that's writing blogs, whether that's volunteering for, let's say this organization, maybe you can write a summary of this workshop, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can take the initiative give yourself a project, right? When I was a grad student, I was like, oh, I, you know, I need to get an internship. You don't know you don't like, you know, yes, apply for internships, apply for fellowships, but don't let that stop you. Don't just sit back and wait for these opportunities, right? People don't have to anoint you in order to do something. Go to your local, you know, coffee shop and, uh, you know, help them survey their customers if you're interested in, in marketing or you're interested in entrepreneurship, right? There's many things that are in your control today that you can do that will actually help you meet people, practice new skills, and figure out what direction is right for you.
Thank you so much. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name earlier, Dania. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, but those are some great kind of actionable pieces of advice that I think all of us are excited about, at least I am. Um, we had one question in the chat. Um, I guess Fenua has already answered it, but it was kind of about salary, like I, going transitioning from academia to outside of academia. Did you notice um, a change in your salary and maybe like how do you negotiate that as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's one reason I wanted to go into the for profit world. I was <laughs> tired of making no money. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I also want to encourage people, you know, if you have a certain lifestyle, if you have a family, you want to have a family, you want to live in a certain place, you know, don't deny yourself these things. Um, it can be very tough if you're going to stay in the academic world to have more ownership over, you know, your life, right? It's, it's like a lot of other programs, medical school, et cetera. You're just kind of stuck. You have to go where the jobs are. You go where, where you get matched, et cetera. Um, but when you decide to step away from that world, there is a lot more flexibility. Um, obviously, there will be hubs where certain types of careers and you know, certain employers tend to be more concentrated. So of course, you want to think about, okay, well, if I want to do X in Y field, right, where are the hubs? Are those places I want to live? What's the standard and cost of living there, et cetera? So you know, those are very practical considerations. But I feel like you know, when I was just stepping out of academia, I felt like I wasn't allowed to think about that, or, you know, it was shallow of me to consider that, but it's not right. Because again, if you don't enjoy your life and that includes all these aspects, you're probably not going to stay in that job for very long. Right. Um, so you really do want to be fair to yourself, um, in terms of what you want to earn, where you want to live, what kind of lifestyle you want. As far as negotiation goes first step. And I think my panelists will probably agree with me. Your first step out of academia tends to be the most difficult. Um, part of that reason is because often we don't have the same depth of experience or work experience that people are looking for, et cetera. That's why, again, you want to do those side projects, right? Because sometimes that can give you those years of experience or at least some experience. Um, so, you know, I would say just be realistic about the first step outside. I'm not, you would always negotiate, always, always negotiate your offer. Um, you know, you, you absolutely can ask for more, whether they give it to you or not is a different story. Right. And that's sort of a combination of like your leverage and how desperate the organization is and maybe how unique you are, um, to that role that they really want to fill. Um, but you know, I'll tell you, like, I was definitely paid somewhat under market for my first application scientist role. And again, part of this, because as if I was a fresh graduate student, I didn't continue into a postdoc. Um, you know, I didn't have that much leverage. However, uh, the organization felt that I was a, re a really unique fit. And again, I was an early customer of their product. So again, that gives you uh, some additional leverage over competitors um, for that job. So what happens though, is that as you get to grow in that role or when you switch to a different um, organization, you can definitely jump in your salary, your title, you know, your roles and your responsibilities. And that's part of what I really enjoy being outside of academia, somewhat more, actually, I would say a lot more flexible, but again, it depends on the, on the field. Um, I've been able to take ownership as I've described in what direction I want to go next. And each time it was driven by what I wanted to do, which has been very refreshing. That's a really helpful answer. Thank you. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, but we have uh, one question left. If you're all okay with sticking around for another couple of minutes. Um, uh, Peter was asking how feasible it is to do research for profit in companies like Microsoft and Amazon um, in our field, if you would know anything about that. Oh, yeah, we have some so hands. It, I, I can like, jump on that very quickly. Just having seen students at, my, at Harvard, for example, in my, in my department, I saw more and more now who are using the PhDs in very diverse ways. And it's really about this, how do you tell the story about what it is that you're doing and what you're excited about? A lot of these companies have interesting problems, right? And it's about you thinking deeply about, okay, well, does that problem apply to a particular skill set that I do have? Or whether it's like data, like big data, for example, analysis, right? Which you maybe you have done in your, in your PhD in neuroscience or something like that. And so there's a way there, you can market that and articulate, yeah, this, this fits. 
So it's just about telling that story, all right? And finding that problem when you do go an interview, how does it fit? How does this fit to what we're doing? It's a very helpful way of framing it. Um, so I think with that, I'd like to thank Joe Fenwell and Vania for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, I feel empowered to, you know, pursue my little side hobbies and, and trust my <laughs> ideas and trust myself. <laughs> um, and I hope that everyone who attended um, got something out of it. I certainly did. Um, I would like to ask, I'm just going to stop the recording now. Um,